thank you, Mika, for the uh, kind introduction. It was kind of very fast, so uh, we're speeding up now uh, in order to save the time for the coffee break. Uh, when um, Louis asked me last year um, to come here and speak about the fourth industrial revolution, I thought, yeah, that's kind of a good idea to do that. And when I realized it's in France, I said, yeah, that's the best place, because you know I'm from Germany. Uh, and for us, uh, France is the home of revolution. So um, I'm trying to shed some light from an economics perspective on that issue. So um, I want to uh, give you a short uh, overview of what um, I'm going to tell you. I want to shed some light on, t on three different questions. The first is, is revolution number four really so different from the revolutions in industry that we've seen before in the last couple of uh, centuries and, and decades? Uh, the second uh, question is, is that really going to be a big, big challenge or a tremendously large challenge? And uh, of course, it's a tremendously large challenge that we are um, facing, and um, uh, which is on the doorstep now. And finally, uh, how can you, in your specific roles, uh, being a CEO or doing business development uh, within uh, innovation hubs or science parks, how can you assist small, and medium-sized enterprises uh, and startups in that situation? So this is basically the story. Um, what I'm going to tell you. So, um, the fourth industrial revolution, um, I know that uh, a couple of people have um, a lot of anxieties uh, when looking at it. However, if we have a look at number one, two, and three uh, from the last centuries, uh, like mechanization, steam power, electricity, computer, and automation, from an economics perspective, they are entirely positive in terms of net wealth, increased income, uh, improved, the standard of living got better, uh, and especially um, the life uh, of more or less everyone on this planet um, became easier. So um, from that perspective, I think uh, we can moderately uh, look optimistic at the fourth industrial revolution uh, being ahead. However, there's a couple of challenges, and I want to highlight some of them. So first of all, uh, whenever we're talking about technological opportunities, um, from an economics perspective, and I'm an econo uh, economist, so I can only tell you uh, my perspective, I'm, I'm not deep into technology or IT, et cetera, then typically we look at it um, uh, identifying S-shaped curves. And you see an S-shaped curve here on the left-hand side um, from uh, the um, last uh, industrial revolution. And we're now um, in the process um, being uh, in the stint of 2015 to 2025, 20, uh, where we try to identify whether the next wave will be a sustaining scenario or a disruptive scenario. If it's a sustaining scenario, uh, then typically most uh, of the firms in markets and industries are able to survive. They will adapt to new technologies, they will learn about it, they will build absorptive capacity and introduce new technologies into their skill set. However, uh, if it's a disruptive scenario, uh, then um, we are running into what uh, might be a churchyard or cemetery for firms. Firms will pass away and there will be new firms. And um, to give you some idea where we as economists think we're standing, um, have a look at this page here. Um, this is two waves of digitalization. And we are currently in the first one on the left-hand side, uh, which I call the complementary and transformative wave. So uh, it was uh, rather optional for most of the firms to decide whether they go from uh, offline to online. And just a number from, from last week from the newspaper in Germany is 65% uh, of all the firms in retail business in Germany uh, decided not to go online as of today. They are still only offline. So it was optional. It was not mandatory. And of course, most of the firms have been able to survive not doing Web 2.0, not doing digital processes, not creating apps for uh, smartphones. However, the next wave will be disruptive and replacing. Um, uh, topics that are coming up uh, are like platforms, ecosystems, big data, predictive analytics, and artificial intelligence. And uh, you need to adopt to these uh, topics and themes because otherwise uh, your firm uh, will disappear. Uh, in a sense, for innovation hubs and uh, technological um, uh, supporters like you are, uh, you need to be aware of that uh, the demand of these firms will change dramatically. Uh, you need to support them uh, so that they find a new way into that uh, second uh, paradigm of a disruptive uh, replacing uh, digital wave. So um, summing up uh, everything that we know so far about um, industrial revolutions, um, we might use that framework here. It summarizes for the first three uh, uh, digital, uh, not digital, but industrial revolutions, the patterns or the focus and objectives 
uh, in order to create competitiveness. And what you see um, is that um, along the dimensions of automation, process, competitive advantage, etc., over the last couple of decades, things changed a lot. And we can only speculate a little bit uh, about the fourth industrial revolution, but what we know so far, what we see at the horizon, is that automation will focus definitely uh, not on control anymore, which is today the main topic, it will be on decision making. Um, in terms of process, as of today, we focus on information. So information is at the very core if we try to optimize processes. In the near future, it will be knowledge. So knowledge will be more important here. Uh, competitive advantage will come out of connectivity. No more of um, like coordinating value chains and improving uh, the, the process structure of your production. Uh, with that, organizations will be more open and just combining connectivity and openness of organizations uh, and the competitive advantage uh, measure, uh, what we'll see pretty likely is that we have blurring ecosystems. So blurring ecosystems means that we are not able to identify industries, firms, and markets anymore in the near future. So whatever you uh, take as granted as of today, like automobile industry, telco, uh, a specific firm, a specific skill will disappear, or at least uh, there will be a foggy situation in the years to come. So you have to navigate yourselves, but especially your clients, uh, through that foggy situation. And finally, uh, the mode of governance will change a lot uh, from uh, what we have today, contracts, contract with the people that work for your firm, or contract with uh, B2B situations, your customers, your collaborators, into uh, more or less spontaneous uh, projects. So my advice here would be uh, that you should um, uh, add up or center your uh, activities um, all around these new patterns on the right-hand side under uh, revolution number four, in terms of decision-making, et cetera, in order to improve uh, the probability uh, that your organization and, of course, your clients might survive uh, that next stage. I have been talking now uh, a little bit about disruption, so um, I think it's kind of important um, to have a precise understanding of what disruption really means. And from an economics perspective, um, it has two basic requirements. The first requirement is actually that um, the uh, disruptive innovation, whatever it might be, technology or something else, uh, destroys existing knowledge. And in addition to that, it needs to destroy existing customer relationship. If one of these requirements is missing, then we, from an economics perspective, we're talking about revolution, uh, revolutionary uh, innovations or other types of innovation, niche creation, etc. But if these two requirements are fulfilled, then it's a disruptive um, innovation, definitely. Uh, if that is happening, then typically the competitiveness is shifted towards new firms, towards startups, so they become better positioned in the uh, competitive uh, situation. And as a consequence, typically, some of the startups, some of the new firms are able um, to uh, drive uh, market leaders, incumbent firms out of the market. So this is the basic scenario of disruption. And we see that a lot uh, as of today, if you look at Uber, at Netflix, at Airbnb, at Booking.com, et cetera, uh, in a very fast um, manner, uh, displacing incumbent firms and revolutionizing uh, whole industries. So uh, when it comes to um, disruption and digitalization, um, we can identify uh, three main, uh, let's say, drivers or levers for disruption, which are big data, artificial intelligence, and platforms. Um, I'm not drilling too deep into uh, technological insights here, but just to give you an idea from an economics perspective, what does big data mean? Big data means that you use data that comes from outside your organization. So that's not coming from marketing, from sales, from controlling department but coming from the market, from your competitors, from Google, from Facebook, et cetera, and you incorporate that data into your decision making. If that is true, as a um, direct consequence, we have blurring industry and market boundaries. So we can't really say you are in the automobile industry. Just to give you a good example, um, just last week ended the uh, International Automobile Fair in Frankfurt, uh, and years ago it was the Automobile Fair. Um, today it's the Mobility Fair because um, automobile firms are no more in the automobile industry. They are now uh, moving on into something else. Uh, artificial intelligence means uh, to me, and from an economics perspective, that um, you have algorithms uh, that help you identifying options for decision making. Um, in the near future, uh, with evolutionary algorithms, it might be uh, that it's not only options, but that the computer, that the algorithm is um, 
taking uh, uh, over and uh, doing the decision making for you. If that is true, your organization uh, and pretty much just uh, the routines that you have in your organization are obsolete. You don't need, need a firm anymore. and You don't need a manager anymore. And you need to uh, come up with solutions for that. And the last point here, uh, platforms based on uh, direct or indirect network effects with Amazon, with Uber, et cetera, uh, lead to the fact that typically most of the firms are currently serving products or doing services to B2B, B2C customers um, are losing their business model. So they have to redefine themselves and either join a platform, an existing platform, or uh, come up with a known platform and try to uh, establish what uh, we call an ecosystem there. So if that is all true, and I, I at least believe uh, that it's true because we have um, very good uh, scientific um, uh, support for that uh, from a lot of studies from a lot of countries, um, then the big question is, how shall you uh, deal with it? And, and what could be, um, as I call it, a roadmap for innovation hubs for the next maybe 10 years? So first of all, you have to realize, you see here on that picture, is that approximately 70% uh, of all R&D efforts are currently running into what we call exploitation, exploitation of the existing business model. So you try to deepen your knowledge that you already have to improve it, to optimize it. Another 15% approximately go into product development and another 10% into process development. And only 5% are, as of today, going into what we call exploration, which means looking for new horizons in uh, the sphere of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, if that is true, and the aforementioned issues are true as well, then one first task is actually to shift efforts, to shift R&D um, um, expenditures towards uh, exploration to better understand uh, the new horizons, the new boundaries of your industries, of your markets, and your firms. Uh, that's very important. The second thing, which is very important, I'm talking a lot to um, owners and uh, managers of SMEs, is uh, digitalization is not IT. Uh, whenever I'm talking to them, they uh, ask me, Marcus, uh, shall I invest in hard or in software? And my typical answer is you should invest in people. People is much more important uh, than hard or software because people drive digitalization. They look for solutions, they create solutions, uh, and that will be true and remain true uh, in the two or three decades to come. Uh, no one knows what happens in 2050 or later, but for today, it's very important that big data, AI, and platforms are just the levers or the driving forces behind digitalization. But you need to come up with solutions um, that are based on new work scenarios, on collaboration, on free and freemium business models, on convergence, and especially on personalization of services and products, which is much more important. So digitalization uh, is, of course, aligned with IT solutions, but it's not based on them. So, um, how is the situation in Germany? This is just a, a pretty short uh, snapshot um, of what we um, can see uh, how firms deal in Germany uh, with the uh, new challenges from the fourth industrial revolution. First of all, on the uh, left-hand side, on the top, you see the large firms in Germany, and you see a couple of uh, familiar names, probably Siemens, Lufthansa, etc., are setting up what we call innovation hubs. Typically, these innovation hubs deal with digital issues, and typically they are located far away from the headquarters because they want to make sure that the ideas that they create are not killed by senior managers from the existing business uh, during lunchtime, probably, or during having a coffee break. So um, not all firms are large firms. Uh, the smaller ones, SMEs, are typically trying to get in touch with um, innovation hubs, with technology parks, with science parks. Um, and we have a network now in Germany. This is not the full picture here, but uh, gives you some idea of how it's organized. Because they say, uh, we can't deal with it on our own. Uh, this is basically driven by the uh, current situation of the business cycle. Capacity is pretty much um, filled uh, with uh, existing business, so people do not have too much time to think about uh, things uh, in, in terms of big data and AI, so universities might help a lot. Um, if that is um, uh, a picture that you agree on, um, then as a consequence, on the right-hand side, there follows um, a little bit of action for you uh, needed. Um, as I stand, uh, I understand, and I have been talking to a couple of you yesterday, um, more or less everyone is aware now that you should leave your old business model in order uh, to provide infrastructure and location, and you need to enhance it by uh, providing services for R&D, for business development, doing a little bit of acceleration incubation, and of course, uh, providing access to uh, funding and finance. And maybe 
if you, um, uh, let's say, uh, accompany the firms into the market later on, uh, there might be a mode of consulting these firms uh, once they're in the market. Uh, because um, what I think is necessary, you uh, and your clients need to monetize on innovation. And I have been talking uh, to some of you, and um, even today, uh, what is your main KPI? Uh, and more or less everyone came up with a KPI that is, I count projects, or I count square meters, or I count something else. It's all input. So probably uh, what is necessary for you uh, is to translate these inputs into outputs and come up with uh, a couple of uh, very um, uh, good KPIs uh, that um, might guide your business into a uh, profitable uh, future that uh, helps to create benefits for your clients uh, in a better, even better way. So um, summing up a little bit, uh, what do I think are the strategic uh, challenges um, that are at the doorstep if we're running into the fourth industrial revolution now. Um, I just want to mention six of them, uh, which are uh, highlighted a little bit here on that slide. So the first is um, what we see is new price wars um, within uh, the digital situation. So oh, it's broken again. Um, so uh, typically, uh, there's a lot of products out there, a lot of services, uh, mainly apps as of today, but later on it will be other services um, uh, as well, that are offered for free, uh, for free and forever. So Google would never ask you uh, to pay money for search. Facebook would never ask you for uh, paying for the membership. Of course, they use your data, uh, and of course, you own the data that you give to them, but they will never create revenue out of uh, the original service. They will always have some additional complementary service uh, that is um, able to create revenues. And whenever I'm talking to um, uh, the owners or managers of SME uh, uh, corporations, and I say, okay, what will be your product that you offer for free forever in the near future in order to get in touch with new customers, in order to build relationships, in order to create uh, an ecosystem that is viable in the digital uh, future? The second thing is um, you need to think about um, the fact that typically um, ecosystems uh, and multi-sided markets lead um, to a situation where the winner takes it all. So. Um, Probably uh, hardly anyone in the room here can name the second largest competitor to WhatsApp, uh, because typically the market leader uh, in a multi-sided market takes approximately 100% market share, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the rest is approximately zero. So you need to decide whether or not to join on an existing platform or to compete and provide an uh, own platform uh, and collaborate with your competitors or maybe suppliers and customers. Um, then, uh, and you already know that, and, and some of you um, are pretty um, aware of it, uh, there's a new war for talents, not only because the business cycle globally had been uh, fundamentally great uh, during the last decade, but uh, especially there's a new generation of people coming up, uh, just leaving the uh, universities now, looking for a different um, style of life, uh, work-life patterns, et cetera, and they have different expectations um, in terms of remuneration and, and um, style of work. So you need to uh, come up with a solution for that. Um, another thing which is very important, um, most new competitors that uh, you will see will come from outside your industries, uh, like GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and a lot of others from China maybe, Tencent, et cetera. Um, so please be aware uh, that the main um, competitors and uh, aggressors or, or uh, firms uh, that are going to attack your business model are from outside your, your current industry and market. And then, very important point here is uh, plug-and-play business models uh, might uh, take over. What does that mean? Um, I have been talking about uh, connectivity a little bit. What does connectivity essentially mean? Connectivity means uh, that interfaces, which are currently a problem, typically, won't be a problem in the near future. So plug-and-play means that you overcome the problem of interfaces by solutions that overlap. And firms that can create competitiveness out of uh, connectivity will excel really on plug-and-play business models. And finally, we have a cross-dimensional convergence, uh, things like global uh, versus local versus regional, physical versus digital, et cetera, will disappear, won't play a role anymore. Um, so out of that, out of these uh, six key strategic uh, challenges, there are six management um, topics that you need to solve. Um, the first couple in the top row are um, more or less connected with the question, should you do digitalization by yourself or should you delegate it? 
And of course, um, if you want to be a front runner, be successful with digitalization, you should definitely uh, do it on your own. Um, there's a question behind that, and I just had been talking uh, to Rogelio uh, before about Telefonica. And Telefonica in Germany, um, they had a CDO, a chief digital officer, um, for the last four years. Uh, and um, this guy stepped down, and the whole division uh, is now integrated into the business. Because they realized, okay, digitalization is a joint effort of the board of the firm. It's not a single purpose, whatever person or division. It needs to be uh, integrated uh, in the whole process of delivering services and products to the firms. Um, then another question on the left um, uh, bottom row, you see uh, a lot of CEOs ask me, uh, my customers are not ready yet for digitalization, so I have to wait for them. Uh, my typical answer here is, please don't wait. Uh, please uh, be a front runner. Don't wait for your customer. There's other customers that are already waiting for you in terms of digitalization, and if your customers are not ready, probably the customers will disappear as a customer in the next decade, because everyone will be digital. Uh, in connection with that uh, is the question, um, shall you increase or transform your portfolio? That'll mean, uh, shall you take all the products and services that you have and um, digitalize, uh, digitalize them? Or um, shall you uh, build a new portfolio and then shift your efforts, your people, your organization into the new world? Uh, that depends a lot on the firm that you're in, the market that you're in, so there is no general answer to that. However, you have to come up with a solution to that for your organization and, of course, for your clients. And finally, uh, an example from Germany again, uh, should you integrate or separate uh, the new business from the existing ones? A good example is Daimler-Benz. Um, Daimler uh, took over the business of Smart, uh, the provider or uh, manufacturer of the small cars, and decided actively to build that car, the Smart car, in France. Not in Germany, not near Stuttgart, because they said, okay, if we build that small car next to the headquarter, Typically, a manager would come over and say, okay, this is not really a car, this is not really an engine, this is not um, like a Daimler should look like. Um, and the only option for them was to do it somewhere else, and they are pretty successful. And we have a lot of examples in Germany um, where firms say, okay, uh, we uh, follow a greenfield approach, we go somewhere else in order to um, build new um, business um, that is not really connected to the old one. So, um, summing up uh, what I've just mentioned, uh, the fourth industrial evolution, a uh, revolution, sorry, from, from an economics perspective will definitely shift from only my perspective from economics, not technologically, um, innovation towards open knowledge-based and cyber-physical systems. That's a matter of fact as, as far as we can see it now. Uh, competitiveness will depend a lot more than today on uh, artificial intelligence, um, which uh, will be at the core for decision making at big data, which will blur industries, markets, and firms, boundaries, uh, and on platforms. Uh, and what we see uh, in the next years to come is what I call the second wave of digitalization, which is mandatory for everyone in all markets everywhere. So the action to be taken is probably for you and your clients uh, to focus on exploration not on exploitation, so not deepening knowledge, but creating new knowledge outside um, what you uh, currently have, just looking beyond your nose um, and uh, dipping into deep waters. Um, create uh, business models um, that um, focus on connectivity, because I think connectivity will be the base for comp competitiveness in the near future. And finally, create uh, new business models uh, that adapt to all these uh, things that uh, are going to happen. So thank you very much for listening to me. It was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, I'm around for uh, a couple of hours today and uh, tomorrow, so whenever you have a question, just uh, get in touch. Uh, thank you very much.